But the motorcycle oil continues to be one of our, uh, I guess you just refer to it as hot products. It sells very well. And the reason it sells very well is motorcycle oils have to be actually constructed different than automotive oils. And um, most of you guys in here probably are familiar with that, but we'll go over it anyway. In motorcycles versus cars, there's a couple things that you have to look out for. And probably the one that we hear the most often is wet clutch application. Everybody know what that means? Kind of? Duty? I'm not sure? Okay. Close of things. Yes, what does it mean? <laughs> Most of the time, if you were to look in a manual shift transmission sitting on a car, you'd have a bell housing with a clutch inside of it that sits in air, and when you press the clutch pedal, it disengages the two faces of the clutch and the flywheel, and then when you uh, release the pedal, the springs push it back, and it engages, and that's what allows you to shift gears because you're disengaging from the drive of the engine. That's a clutch. In motorcycles, they have a clutch which sits in oil. The same oil that is running the engine, it lubricates the wet clutch and lubricates the transmission, or the primary it's called in their application. So what you have is a situation a little bit more similar to what you have in an automatic transmission where the assembly is full of oil. Transmission, automatic transmission is full of fluid and the clutches that are inside the automatic transmission, they have the same problem. They engage as wafers. One, you have a system of them, and they engage together. Well, they're sitting in oil, so you have to make sure that you manufacture the oil in a manner that it'll allow these clutches to engage and not slip. Because oil between moving parts is supposed to lubricate and allow them to continue to move without any friction. But we don't want that. We want oil to get out of the way and allow the friction plates of the clutch to engage and actually give us the turning motion that we need. So for motorcycle oils to be wet clutch compatible, you're worried about a couple things in the oil. Does anybody know what that is offhand? It really comes oh, up. in a place to grab and everything else to slide. That's right. You've got two things working opposite. One is just like you said, you want the clutch is to grab, but you want the bearings and all the other moving parts to slide without friction. So you're kind of saying, wait a minute, I want this product to do two things which are opposite. I want it to lubricate, give me good motion between metallic objects, and at the same time, I want to also engage these clutch fixes. Well, the single additive that gets in the way of that the most in motor oils are viscosity improvers. Now, that takes a minute to say, what's a viscosity improver and how could it do that? Well, we make these multi-grade oils today. We're trying to have an oil that will flow well at very cold temperatures and still reach some level of viscosity thickness to have an oil film which will protect moving parts at high temperature under load. So we measure the operational viscosity at 210 degrees and we measure its winter operating capability, the W in that little 5W30 number, let's use that as an example. We measure that at a cold temperature to see how well parts can move around in this thick oil. Okay? And that's our winter rating is measured a little different than the viscosity measurement at high temperature. But the point is, in order to accomplish this thing, we put these things in oil called viscosity improvers. And if you can imagine, for the ladies here, they can, when you make gravy and you put starch in the gravy and it begins to thicken the gravy. Well, the idea with viscosity improvers is you put them in the oil, and what they are initially is like a long piece of hair. Not that long, I'm exaggerating, but microscopically, like a straight, linear piece of hair. Nice thin thing. It's cold. They just slide past each other. They don't create much thickness. As you begin to heat the oil up, these long, thin polymers begin to curl up, sort of like a coil spring. So what happens is, is they begin to make themselves larger in the solution of oil than they were when they were long and thin. Therefore, the more of them that begin to increase their size by curling up, the thicker they make the oil. So viscosity improvers are simply polymers that change shape to give us 
a different viscosity world at high temperature than we had at cold temperature. Simple stuff. However, those little boogers in a wet clutch application, they like to just go and plate out on the surface of the clutch face. And the more of them that plate out there, pretty soon the clutch face becomes glassy smooth with all these plastic, it's like pasta soling the surface of your abrasive clutch face until it can no longer make any engagement. So the number one thing that we have to be careful of in multi-grade oils for motorcycles is how we put viscosity improvers on them. Now, one good thing about high-performance synthetic oils is you can almost make these oils with no viscosity improvers whatsoever. You can put them in there for a little high and a little low end improvement in the oil, but in general, you can flat out make a 10W30 or a 5W30 level oil without putting any viscosity improvers in it, just making it from a good synthetic base stock. So you start out with one leg up when it comes to making synthetic motorcycle oil. You don't need a lot of VI to make this stuff work. Second part is, in all of our energy efficient oils. You know, you look on the, the little donut and it says energy efficient oil, okay? They all have friction modifiers. Friction modifiers, again, are polymers added to assist in making the surface of the metal look ever more smooth and giving us a much more laminar flow, laminar surface, so that we reduce friction and we enhance fuel efficiency by reduced friction. So friction modifiers, if you can imagine they're in there specifically to do something with the surface of the metal, what are they going to do in a wet clutch? They're going to go right to the surface of the metal, which is the clutch, which has the greatest places for them to get right in there, like going into sandpaper, and they're just going to clog it up. So you, can just, you just cannot use friction modifiers in motorcycle oil. <clears throat> just got to be Okay, now, Japanese have a spec called JSO, and it is funny, because think about this for a minute. This is Japanese, right? And their organization is the Japanese Association, no, Automobile Standards Organization, J-A-S-O. I thought that was just Amsoil Synthetic Oil. <laughs> that, no, I, that's perfect. That's very good, Alan. But the truth is, it is odd, because they do not have a Japanese name for this organization. They name their Japanese organization with an English name. The reason? Because they don't really have a lot of Japanese words for all these technological things that have been developed, so they use English. But anyway, the JSO established for motorcycles an MA rating. And you'll see it on our oil. It says JSO MA. And what JSO MA means is wet clutch compatible. So when you see an oil and it says it's, someone's going to use it in their motorcycle and it doesn't have JSO MA on it, you'll question whether or not it's really wet clutch compatible. Okay. So that's just good information to know because when you go out to select a motorcycle oil, number one, really, um, you don't want it to, the multi-grade oils are okay with the, with the modern viscosity improvers, but in petroleum oils you have to put so much VI to get that oil to make a rating of let's say 10W40 or 20W50, you've got to probably easily 10 times as much viscosity improver in that oil to get it to work as you need in a synthetic oil. So number one, you start out with your, your foot in the bucket when you're using petroleum multi-grade oils in your motorcycle. Remember a lot of people would say they were always looking for the straight 60 or the straight 50 or straight 40 for motorcycles in the past. They didn't know why they were looking for that. It had been advised to them to look for that in the old days, but that's why, because there was no viscosity improvers, no friction modifiers, and that kind of oil. Now, one of the things that you'll see going around the industry for motorcycles is to use diesel oil in your motorcycle. Actually, you can, because it is going in the right direction. Diesel oils, because they're up in the 40 weight range, 15W40, see that, that gets a little bit narrower, 15W40 instead of 5W40. So a 15W40, because of that narrow range, doesn't have a significant amount of viscosity improver in it to do that. And a lot of diesel oils do not have friction modifiers in them. They're just not there. So when a person says, well, I'm going to use Shell Rotella in my motorcycle, it's going in the right direction. So it's not to say, well, that's crazy. Why are you doing that? No, it's going in the right direction. 
Now, what would be wrong with going out here today and, and buying a quart of good, uh, let's just say even Mobile One synthetic uh, SN rated motor oil? Anybody want to know what would be wrong with running that in your motorcycle? No zinc and phosphorus. Low zinc and molybdenum. Low zinc and phosphorus primarily. Molybdenum is something that they're adding in some cases to try to make up for low zinc. We'll see where that works out. Amsoil's even experimenting, not a motorcycle oil, but some of the other oils with what they call organic molly to try to replace some of the zinc and phosphorus they've lost in these new EPA restrictions on SN rated oil. Motorcycles in particular need high zinc and phosphorus. Those are anti-wear additives. And when you run motorcycles around, you have a <laughs> relatively small engine, sometimes producing quite a lot of power. So these engines need protection. And there's one other aspect of motorcycle oil that you don't see so much in cars, and that's the fact we talked about that primary before where that clutch is located. You've got more gears again, stuff going on that that oil has to prevent wear in those, those gears. So you need an oil that actually can qualify for some gear loop application. Now remember, Angel was pretty much, uh, what's the best way to say it? Proud of, let's just say that, proud of the fact that they made these motorcycles from the ground up and they achieved an actual GL1 gear loop rating with these oils, which is good because in a motorcycle application, remember what we say for a Harley, and a Harley that we can use 20W50 in all three chambers? Meaning we can use it in the engine, we can use it in the transmission, and we can use it in the rear. Primary. Primary. So what we're talking about here is that the 20W50 functions like a decent gear loop. Not good enough for the rear end of your car. I don't yeah. put 20W50 in the back of your car, but for that application, it achieves that. So see, motorcycle oils need to have higher anti-wear capability. They need to be wet, clutch compatible. They need to be not trying to put too much VI improver in them because there's another thing that happens to those VI polymers that I wanted to mention. In certain mechanical situations with a lot of stress, you can shear those things. If you shear them off, mechanically break them down, they'll no longer thicken the oil. It's called shear back. So in, in heavy duty diesel engines and things like motorcycles, you got to be careful that you use only modern high quality viscosity improvers or else you could find yourself shearing back and never make it to a 50 weight oil, only make it up to maybe a 30 in, in a Harley or an application like that. So shear back is a problem. So again, let's look at this just from the top to the bottom. We're looking for motorcycle oil. What we do is we look in the owner's manual, determine whether we, they, that manufacturer tells us to use a 50 weight or a 40 weight or a 30 weight, and maybe sometimes a 60 weight. Leave it to the manufacturer. They made the thing, they know the weight of oil, that needs to go in it. We don't need to argue about that or question that. They made it, put it in there. They say run a 2050 in a water-cooled bike. I've seen it. Then run the 2050 in a water-cooled bike. I go by the thumb rule that if it's water-cooled 10, 40, 20, but there's some of these high-performance bikes that are made. I think Buell might be one. Oh, man, you don't have no clue as to how hot my bike gets. Well, that, I know, but yours is an air-cooled. Yeah. Yeah, water-cooled is what I'm talking about. Like oh, it's car, kind of a radiator. Oh, it does. Oh, yeah. What kind of you driving? All right, Kawasaki. Oh, Kawasaki. Okay, yeah. And and you're right. Kawasaki knows how hot it gets, so they may say run a 2050. I could, I could cook oil on I could cook an egg on that engine. <laughs> Whereas uh, the big Honda Goldwing engines, 1800cc, uh, those kind of engines, it's like driving around in a small car. They just took the engine out of the car, they stuck it on the motorcycle. It runs just as cool as the car. So the manufacturer knows what he made, so we can rely upon the thickness of oil that they recommend. Now, once we do that, now we're looking at what's the next thing. We want a wet clutch compatible oil for these guys. Okay? And then we're looking and saying, well, what about if I want to use this in either the transfers or the primary, these kind of things? Well, look at what the owner's manual says. And the owner manual says you can use 20W50 in those chambers. Yeah. It'll say only synthetic 20W50. It won't tell you you can use the other stuff. No. Then we can do that. So motorcycle oils today are manufactured from the ground up to meet the requirements of a motorcycle engine transmission application, wet clutch. It's not, not smart for the owner of a motorcycle to go out and buy uh, an SN rated automotive oil. 
the zinc and phosphorus is limited to 800 parts per million in those oils. It is common for motorcycle oils to be 11 or 1200 minimum uh, parts per million of zinc and phosphorus. So if you've got customers and you advise them, they say, well, I just run whatever I can get in my motorcycle. You ask them if they know a good mechanic, recommend one to them for when it starts to wear out. Um, and there are more of these uh, Japanese bikes coming, uh, starting to use the 10W30. We're going to see more of that 10W30 motorcycle oil starting to be sold. But at the same time, it seems like we can't never stop selling the, the 60 weight motorcycle oil for Harleys. I mean, every time I turn around, I'm buying more cases of that for people who want the 60 weight oil. So hey, my, my engine is basically designed like Harley. I have a 1700 two jug engine. Yeah, big V twin. Right. And it, it runs at 200 degrees. Yeah, now the thing about that is, too, is that when you, these high temperatures that we run, I know. Um, we've had guys with Harleys before tell us that uh, they would get in a parade type thing over here at the Daytona Bike Week Show years off. ago, and it would start losing compression because it would get so hot it would lose compression from run. Up. And then they shifted over to an Amsoil 20W50. And they sat in traffic, did the whole same stuff with it, and never had a problem with the losing compression and shutting down. Why? Because that synthetic engine oil doesn't thin out and lose compression. 